Welcome to Speak for Yourself from the Crib, presented by Hyundai. Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley, coming to you from our cribs here in Los Angeles. All right, we have a great show planned for you today. LeVar Arrington's going to join us. So will Reggie Bush. With LeVar, I think we'll talk about Lamar Jackson hanging out with Antonio Brown. With Reggie Bush, I can't think of it. <laughs> it slipped my mind right now, but Reggie Bush will join us in the second half of the show. All right, but I want to start today's show uh, talking about a dear friend of mine and a friend I'm sure Marcellus knows him, Mike Ornstein. Mike Ornstein is a guy with a long history in the National Football League. Mike, uh, I think, started coming to uh, a little notoriety when he worked for Al Davis and the Raiders organization. Uh, the last few years or the last decade, decade and a half or so, He's been closely associated with the New Orleans Saints and Sean Payton. Anybody with a connection to the National Football League knows who Mike Ornstein is. Uh, Listen, Mike's been involved in some controversy, uh, but I think that most people connected to the NFL consider Mike a great asset to the NFL, a stand-up guy. Mike and I started out as adversaries. He was very close and worked with as a marketing agent for Marcus Allen when Marcus played in Kansas City, Marcus and I got into it, and that meant me and Mike Ornstein got into it back in those days. But now I consider Mike a a good friend, and we talked this morning about sports and the NFL draft and how the NFL is moving forward. And Mike, if you know anything about him, and again, most of you don't, but people connected to the NFL do, Mike has struggled with his health in the last few years. And there was a time a year and a half ago, two years ago, where we thought Mike was going to leave us, but he has since rebounded. And it led to a conversation we were having this morning, Mike and I, about, hey, Mike expressing to me, look, man, I probably got seven, eight, nine, ten more summers left in my life. This coronavirus shutting everything down. I'm not living right now. I'm existing. Mike's divorced. He has a kid. His ex-wife comes to visit him from time to time. His son, I think, checks on him every day. But Mike is a guy that has lived his life in airport, city to city. If there was a big football event, Mike was always there. Mike is a guy that has lived on the move. He's a social animal. Mike's in his late 60s. He raises the question of, How long should we go with this quarantine? I want to live out my golden years. I don't want to exist in my golden years. This is day 32 for Mike in quarantine. And I bring all this up because Adam Schefter of ESPN, who I think all of us clearly are friends with and have a great deal of respect for, Adam Schefter said on ESPN that he thinks it's basically irresponsible for the NFL to go on with this draft. I think his direct quote was, quite frankly, he found it cold-hearted for the NFL to continue with this draft. And I couldn't disagree with Adam Moore respectfully. And I think in talking to Mike Ornstein this morning, it really came into vision and, and, and full fruition for me why I disagree with Adam Schefter here and the people that think we should shut it down and stop what we're doing We can't do that. And this is not the first time America and the globe has dealt with a pandemic outbreak that can can kill you, can really do damage to you. I was talking to my mother this week about polio. From the 1920s throughout the 1950s, there were massive polio outbreaks across America. At one time, we had a president, President Roosevelt, uh, who suffered from polio and was crippled by polio. It was also a a disease you could get from contact with people with polio. Uh, I read stories this morning about football games that were uh, that went on and transpired college football games when there were polio outbreaks in those cities or affecting those teams. I think it would be a mistake to shut things down. I think that football and sports should as best they can continue to move forward. I think sports play an important role in moving us forward in this crisis. And so I couldn't disagree with Adam Schefter more. And so I want to bring uh, Mark Slareth in from Denver. Obviously, uh, Marcellus is here. 
And we're going to have a discussion about what role sports will play in continuing to move us forward. The only thing I want to just ask you all is just we're not pretending to be experts. We're not coronavirus experts, but we are just a group of men who have opinions about this, who live in the sports world, who, again, don't hold us to expert standards. We're not trying to be experts. But, Marcellus, I want to start with you. What role do you think, I think, sports is going to play a critical role in moving us forward as a society? Is that something you agree with, disagree with? I just don't think we can shut down things forever. Yeah, I think it's a very difficult blanket statement to make, no matter what side you're on. If you're eager to get back th things back to normal or if you're a person that's saying, hey, uh, let's be uberly cautious and uh, uber cautious in these moments because we know what's going on and there's a lot of unknown out there. Uh, it's interesting that I disagree with Adam in terms of getting the NFL draft going and, and trying to get back to normalcy in terms of the NFL because – uh, this is okay for the NFL to still conduct business as usual in terms of the draft. Adam referenced that there won't be any OTAs, there won't be any offseason, and now we shouldn't have the draft. Well, I'm here to tell Adam that when I got drafted in 1997, we didn't have OTAs. <laughs> we didn't have an offseason program. We showed up for training camp. And I think we had a mini camp, and even that wasn't mandatory for it seemed like everyone because I didn't see full attendance. That said, football can still be played without this offseason being normal, especially the draft. That can still go on. But I think if you're a person who is directly affected by the coronavirus or will be directly affected, including those who have lost loved ones or will lose loved ones. I've had a friend who lost his aunt in the last couple of days, and he had a different complexion to this conversation than he did a week or two ago. So with that said, it depends on how it lands in your life as sports is a distraction, but the attraction is your normal day-to-day -day life. And if this consumes you because you lost a, a loved one or you're affected by it, I think that you look at sports entirely different than someone who hasn't been affected. Yeah, I think that Mark. sports is the great. I, I think that sports is a great connector. And one of the things that I find really interesting, and I disagree with Adam, and I totally agree with you, Jason, is that this helps move us forward. Now, listen, you have to adhere to the CDC or regulations and all those things, but the draft can certainly be done without the hoopla, without the fanfare, and without all the people. You're connected. We are completely connected together through technology. And I will say this: never before have we been more connected. Um, as a people through technology, we spend the entire of, entirety of our lives right here on a four-inch iridescent screen, right, and less connected as people. That's an issue that we have. And I will tell you that football and sports in general is a great connector. I had the opportunity to go sit at the Super Bowl and watch right from, you know, the 40-yard line in a section of Kansas City Chiefs fans. And I got to tell you, being a Former uh, player for Mike Shanahan, I was rooting hard for the 49ers and Kyle Shanahan, and I was talking so much trash right up till third down and 15 when uh, Wasp was called and Patrick Mahomes made one of the most incredible plays in Super Bowl history. And I've got to tell you, at the end of the day, with a bunch of 30-year-old Kansas City fans, we connected as people, man. There were hugs all the way around, even though we were talking trash to one another. We had a blast, and the connectivity that sports brings to this country is what helps heal us. And we saw it in 9-11, and I think we'll see it again throughout this coronavirus issue that we're having. Look, I, I'm sure Adam Schefter has a relationship with, with Mike Ornstein, like myself and many people in the media. I, I would love for Adam to talk to guys like Mike again because we are very blessed. And Mike and I talked about this this morning in terms of what I'm talking about, Mark Schlereth, Marcellus Wiley, Jason Whitlock, we're blessed that we actually have something to do. Fox Sports is continuing on. We're doing our television show. We have a purpose every morning when we get up. That's very important to a guy like Mike Ornstein. He has spent his entire life on the go, doing things, being productive, helping people move along in their careers. And when you take that away, in his golden years, and he's sitting there at home thinking, how many, 30 more days, 60 more days, 90 more days of just existing rather than living. I, I think it's a point of view and a perspective 
we're going to have to consider. And, and I think the NFL, and again, I, I, we've heard Mike Florio criticize why is the NFL doing free agency. Now we're hearing Adam Schefter. These guys are two respected voices that have covered the NFL for a long time. Why are they doing the draft? And, and, and I actually think the NFL is being very responsible here in trying to provide a sense of normalcy and not just giving in to all the fear. The decision-making that I think a lot of people are making and are forcing on others is make decisions based out of fear. And I just don't think that's a healthy way to make decisions. The NFL needs to remain responsibly bold and moving forward as best they can responsibly. And I just think the NFL draft is a no-brainer to do right now. Marcellus, I'm just telling you, as a kid, when you go back to being a prospect, 21, 22 years old, you think Joe Burrow and these guys want the draft delayed? No, not at all. Obviously, uh, they're incentivized to get things rolling and get things back to normal as fast as possible. And that's why it's, it's very difficult to make a blanket statement for everyone in terms of how they're receiving this. But in terms of leadership and the NFL and the commissioner, uh, you have to return to that, that normalcy sooner than later. I, I will say one thing, I, I guess in pushback to Ornstein, who says right now in my twilight years, hey, I need a purpose. Uh, I don't think that purpose needs to be so much out your house or external. Uh, it's, it's certainly a luxury, and we have that luxury as well, but it's not a necessity. Uh, let me tell you, when I was growing up, I didn't have all the external resources around. And I remember vividly one time I didn't have a way to get to the gym. And I had a friend who was working out with me and he was the only guy who had a car and he wasn't available. And you know what I realized in that moment? This is crazy because I feel the feel the moment like it happened yesterday. I remember wanting to lift weights and, and, and hit the track and do everything that was scheduled and programmed. Instead, I realized I couldn't get to those places and I just looked around my apartment. I looked around my apartment complex. I just looked in my vicinity and realized, oh, these stairs right here, that's going to be my stairs. Me lifting weights, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hit this jailhouse workout, whatever I have to do to get through this. Because if you're a believer, uh, you're a person that knows this too shall pass. And this is different uh, than anything that we've seen before. I just want people to really understand this virus lives on objects for up to weeks. This, uh, this is in the vicinity of you, six feet or more, in terms of being airborne. Polio was through feces and direct contact and bad sanitation areas. Like, when we get into the details of what we're dealing with right now and the aggregation of all of us, that's going to be a very sticky, tough decision to make. When do we all aggregate? But for now, we can all sit in our own comfort of home and watch the draft return and be back to normal in that respect. Mark, Mark, we got 60 seconds. I'll give you a final thought. Well, my final thought is this. I've always said, and I had this meeting with Roger Goodell, don't let people who hate football set the agenda for football. Hey, go do what you have to do to put this draft together because I think it's the right thing to do and we move forward together and it is a distraction and I think it's a good distraction. So I applaud him and as far as complaining about it, he said, he put the moratorium out. Don't complain about this. You're right because everybody's got issues. Deal with it. We're going to be the NFL and we're going to lead in this and I applaud the NFL for doing it. Hey, great points, both of you guys. Really strong stuff, Marcellus. Uh, Mark, I, I just want to be clear. I'm sure if Adam hears this, Mark does not think Adam Schefter hates football. I'm sure of that. Uh, but yeah, he no, is no, no, like I know Adam people loves. that do hate football. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, stick around. <laughs> LeVar Arrington's going to join us. We're going to talk about Lamar Jackson and the workout he had with Antonio Brown. Speak for yourself, presented by Hyundai. More after this. Muscle pain? I'm talking stop in your tracks. I'll never work out again. Oh, my God, what am I going to do kind of pain? This is the kind of pain Dr. Jason Wurzlin was in when he created Theragun, the deep muscle massager that's unlike anything you've ever felt. Theragun isn't a cheap massager that just tickles your muscles. Our handheld percussive device uses a scientifically calibrated combination of speed, depth, and power to release the deepest muscle tension. It's this simple. Whether you want to treat your muscle tension from working out, an injury, or just everyday life, you can use Theragun. 
Theragun is the preferred muscle recovery device for over 250 professional sports teams and is used by hundreds of thousands of satisfied customers around the world to reduce pain, increase range of motion, and soothe aching muscles. Try Theragun risk-free for 30 days or your money back by going to theragun.com slash cadence. For a limited time, listeners who speak for yourself get a free charging stand with the purchase, a $79 value. That's theragun.com slash cadence. That's T-H-E-R-A-G-U-N dot com slash cadence. C-A-D-E-N-C-E. Let's move to today's big story sponsored by KFC. Feed the whole family with KFC's $20 fill up with all the fixings. Order online at kfc.com. Let's move to Lamar Jackson. And the picture he put out yesterday uh, where he worked out with his teammate Hollywood Brown and Antonio Brown, the most infamous wide receiver, not in the National Football League right now. Obviously, Antonio Brown's been involved in a lot of controversy uh, this offseason and all of last year. Uh, Is anybody bothered by the picture of Lamar Jackson, MVP of the league, working out with the most notorious guy in the National Football League right now, Antonio Brown. Marcellus, you bothered? No, not at all, man. Uh, One, everyone has their critics. We all understand that. And uh, those critics are not going to dictate how you should move in terms of dealing with that person. A lot of people out there don't like you, Whitlock. Oh, well. I'm still working with you, still love you, still (laughs) doing my thing with you. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, That's on them. Let them deal with that. And it's funny, this is one, your teammate's cousin. So even if his name was Edward Smith, your teammate cousin can can run fast. Oh, invite him to the workout. Oh, your teammate's cousin is a future Hall of Famer by the name of Antonio Brown? Hell yeah, we're going to throw the rock around with him. I don't have any issues with this in terms of looking at it as an NFL issue. Only thing I do have a problem with is the CDC looking at this like, damn, y'all hugged up a little too tight right now. <laughs> Three dudes, <laughs> they should have put that picture out. The CDC going to be on their head more than the NFL is right now. That's my only issue. <laughs> Lamar? Of course, I, yes, I have an issue. Here's my issue. There shouldn't be so much talent in one photo being posted on social media. I agree with you, Marcellus. They need to wash their hands and make sure they're clean and not spread any germs or anything like this in this this tough time. But, man, look here. Of course I don't have a problem with them working out. They're all Floridians. And and what people may not know about about this group of dudes, A.B. and Chad Johnson uh, and Marquise Hollywood Brown, they're a workout warriors they are always working out there's a ton of workout that they do at different parks different high school fields this is normal life for those dudes so there's nothing different about this other than adding oh yeah pompano beaches lamar jackson to to the equation for this workout who happens to be the teammate of one of the guys working out and and hollywood brown so it's it's fine people are going to speculate we're at a day Right now, where sports is at a standstill, so it makes for good good banter. It makes for good discussion. But this is just dudes working out. That's all it is. Yeah, I, I got to agree with both of you all. Their bond is football. And, and look, Antonio Brown does a lot of stupid things, uh, maybe some things that are illegal, but no one can question the dude loves football. Uh, he may not be consistent in how he shows his love, but in terms of working out and preparing to play the game, he's at the elite of the elite level. And so for Lamar Jackson to bond with him on that level of, man, this dude gets it in in terms of preparation. Let me go out here and get some of this as well. Let me get in his workout flow. Makes perfect sense. I'll just say this. It's, it's amazing the things that bond people. And, and, and I'll just, there's pictures of me with shadier people than Antonio Brown. And I, mm-hmm. again, I can't be a hypocrite here. I, I love to shoot craps. I bonded with some people in Las Vegas over the craps table. We hang out when I go to Vegas. When you know We hang out thick. And some of them are some of the shadiest people on this planet 
Uh, I'm thinking one of them, you know, Avon Barksdale ain't got nothing on him. But on the crab table, we have bonded. So I, I can't be a hypocrite and remotely uh, question this photo. Actually, it's kind of a good look for Lamar Jackson. He's working out. He, he ain't messing around in terms of his workouts. He's working out with the best. Yeah, and in terms of his weaknesses of getting the ball outside the numbers, nobody better out there, especially in your proximity, than Antonio Brown. Uh, the only thing, I, if I'm over here digging, if I'm a teammate on the Ravens, I'm like, hey, Lamar, don't let that dude try to make you his sloppy seconds. You know he wanted Brady this whole offseason. Finally, a couple of days after they say you can't have Brady, then this dude all begging you to work out, even though you know you ain't supposed to be in six feet connection to this dude. So there's a little jest in this, like, wow, where did this pop up, especially the timing of it? But, hey, man, this is a, like, like LeVar said, this is a very talented picture. If this could be reality going forward, woo, that would be something dangerous in Baltimore. Oh, oh, oh. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. Look at that picture right there. I don't think there's more talent out in Florida than the three guys people are looking at right now on TV. I wouldn't be able to disagree with that. I would not disagree with y'all, but... but, uh, (laughs) Hey, let's move to Dak Prescott, uh, because there's been an opinion offered uh, that Dak has a responsibility to the other NFL players to get as much money from Jerry Jones and the Cowboys as possible. The NFL PA would frown upon Dak if he accepted $30 million a year. He's got a responsibility to his peers in the league to be greedy. Uh, Marcellus, I think I know where you're going to yeah. go with this, and I think I'm going to disagree. You already know But me. I'm going to ask you, do you, okay. you, agree, you agree with this? Hell yeah, I agree with this. And, and it's not just that con- contract we're talking about. We're talking about any walk of life. When it's time for you to go get your money, you got the hammer, you better swing it. And it's just not just for you. It's for all those in that same situation that will benefit from the choices you make in terms of your contract. So if you're an office assistant, hey, you got to get the most you can per hour. If not, the next person, whether they're better or worse, they're going to be based in relationship to what you got. So I know this situation personally and intimately. When I got paid my money going from Buffalo to San Diego, I remember talking to Bruce Smith and Junior Seau, two of my mentors and two of the people I looked up to, and two of the people I knew I wasn't better than, but I was going to make more money than them. And both of them told me, to a man, they said, go get yours because it will help all of us later. So to put it in layman's terms for all those people who think we're just greedy athletes, just imagine if the Dallas Cowboys, which is worth north of $5 billion, decided to sell for, let's say, $800,000, just some crazy low number. You know what would happen? 31 owners would be on the phone with Jerry Jones and say, who in the hell are you to set the market so low for all of us? So it's the same situation when it comes to a player. Do not set this market lower than it should be. Go get yours. Well, I disagree. Go ahead, and, LeVar. And, yeah, I disagree. And he has a responsibility to himself to get the best contract that he feels that he can get. Now, I'll say this next thing that I'm saying, prefacing, saying that I have a lot of respect for people that work within the walls of the NFL PA. But you said it right, Whitlock. It is a responsibility to the NFL PA for him to get the best and biggest and highest number contract that he can get so that it's leverageable and the NFL PA has a grounds to stand on and make moves in terms of what the next contracts look like and, and negotiations. But as far as Dak Prescott, the person, the human being himself, the only responsibility he has in his contract negotiation are his interests. What's the best interest for Dak Prescott? What's the interest for Dak Prescott's family in terms of if he's married and has kids? Take care of your home. As, as Marshawn Lynch said, Take care of your chicken. Take care of your chicken. That's all the responsibility he needs let, to have. Let, let me bring some sanity into this conversation because uh, Marcellus took us off into the insane world where he compared Dak Prescott to the Dallas Cowboys. 
the most valuable right. franchise in all of sports. Dak he gonna be is the highest closer paid to the Jacksonville the Jaguars. Team. Dak's closer to the Jacksonville Jaguars than he is the Dallas Cowboys. And so we're not talking about Dak settling for 800000 for a franchise that's worth $5 billion. Let's say the Jacksonville Jaguars are worth $2 billion and you sell for $1.8 billion. Jerry Jones laughs and said, man, they got ripped off. But he, he knows it doesn't affect his value. And so Patrick Mahomes is going to look around, and whatever Dak says has no impact on what Patrick Mahomes is going to get from the Kansas City Chiefs. No impact on what Lamar Jackson is going to get from the Baltimore Ravens. No impact on Russell Wilson. No impact on any of these other elite quarterbacks. The, the cream the of the cream. That's the and important so word. Dak... Again, Dak can settle for less because he has a responsibility to his teammates, the 53 guys in that locker room, and that franchise that has propped him up and put him in a position to make $30 million a year, which was damn good money, and is probably more than he's actually worth. But he's in position to get that money. He needs to thank his teammates. He got a responsibility can, to make sure they have enough salary one? cap room to keep all them extra pieces. Go ahead, Mark. Oh, I'm can, sorry. Can, Go ahead. Can I, can I have this one, Marcellus, real quick? He he does have yeah. a responsibility in, in, in terms of what you just said, Whitlock. He doesn't impact those upper echelons, first-tier quarterbacks. But what he does have impact on are those quarterbacks that are on the same level as him and the quarterbacks that are starting in the league that may be a level below him. By getting the best contract that he can get, he gives those quarterbacks that are on the same tier level as him the ability to get that type of number and demand that type of number. And to the quarterbacks that may just be below him as starters in the National Football League, he gives them that comp to say, okay, I need to make this type of money. Don't say I'm not Russell Wilson or Patrick Mahomes. I'm Dak Prescott. That's important as LeVar, well. We get it. We get it. We get it. Okay. LeVar, I think we okay. get it. You were never okay. on Ray Lewis's level, Erlacher's level, yeah, the elite that's linebacker fair. level. And <laughs> so know, you're looking out fair. for the mediocre linebackers. And I, There's no such I thing agree as with mediocre you. All right, stick around. Wow. <laughs> Not at Darnell all. Darnell Smith at our question of the day. Next. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself from the Crib, presented by Hyundai. All right, time now for Darnell Smith's question of the day. All right, take it away, homeboy. Yes, sir. Let's move to Dallas, where our guy Jay Glazer is reporting the Cowboys have signed former star defensive end Alden Smith to a one-year, $4 million deal. Smith has been out the league since 2015 with major substance abuse problems and legal issues, derailing a promising career. Smith is now sober, but needs Roger Goodell to reinstate him in order to get on the field. And if he does, I want to ask you, you guys think a guy could be an effective pass rusher after being out the game for four years? Oh, oh, absolutely. Man, we all know that youth is wasted on the young, brother. And what I'm hearing right now by the signing of Alden Smith and him being only 30 years old is that the, he's going to have a different approach to the game, and that's going to affect his production. Now, the assumption is it should have a positive effect on the production, but there are no guarantees. But let's make sure we understand approach versus production. I'm not certain how many sacks he'll tally once he gets back on the field, but I'm certain that he's going to give himself the best chance because we have to first start off when Alden was the man, when Alden was setting NFL records for his first two years as a starter and having over 30 sacks. What was Alden Smith's approach to the game then? Certainly it was immature. Certainly all the issues that he got caught up in and the DUIs and everything, the domestic violence, wasn't a good approach, but he had production. And I think between the time that he played last and now in these few years, he's had an epiphany. Oh, I know how to take care of myself better. Oh, I know how to rest better. I know how to approach the game, study harder. All those things which will make him a better pupil, a better student. But there's no guarantees it's going to make him a better player because Tiger Woods tried to clean up his life as well. 
And it ain't the same Tiger Woods that we had before when life was in shambles. So I'm looking forward to seeing how this experiment works because it's worth the risk, it's worth the gamble to see if his better approach adds up to better production. Yeah, I, I think everybody's going to be rooting for Alden Smith. Listen, I remember Alden Smith as a kid at the University of Missouri and just unbelievable talent when he got to the NFL. Just unbelievable talent. A freak of nature, a wiry guy, a, a bit of a, a Javon curse, but, but maybe not as long. Uh, but, but to see this guy use his walk with faith and his belief in God to clean himself up and get this second opportunity, I think everybody around the National Football League will be rooting for him. I think he'll be a positive influence in that locker room. And I think, you know, coming out and maybe giving the Cowboys 15, 20 snaps in certain pass rush situations, yeah, I think he can be an effective player and, and he doesn't have to be on the field all the time to be an effective player. Uh, I, I'm certainly rooting for Alden Smith and, and, and agree with the Cowboys taking this $4 million flyer on Alden. Yeah, if you look at it too, man, just to help people conceptualize it, Howie Long always talked about where's your prime. And I think a lot of us think your prime is when you're 25 to 30. But uh, Howie broke it down where you walk into the league, you're at a physical peak, and you're at a mental low. And there are two elevators that are constantly doing this as you continue to play. And when they finally meet, that's your prime. And it's different for everyone. So hopefully Allen could be in his prime. You're 30. You can still rush the passer physically. But if mentally now you've matched that physical ability, you got something special here. And then you look at it, his D-line coach from the 49ers, Jim Tonsula, is now the D-line coach in Dallas. So a little familiarity there as well to help him go. Let's see it. All right, stick around. Don't go anywhere. Reggie Bush, the Heisman Trophy winner former NFL star. He's going to join us from his crib. We're going to talk about Tua Tung Viola and whether he gets too much attention. All right, welcome back to Speak for Yourself. From the crib, Jason Whitlock, Marcellus Wiley. All right, let's go out to a Heisman Trophy winner's crib right here in the Los Angeles area. Reggie Bush joining us from his hey. crib. And... You got wine bottles as pacifiers at your crib? I mean, you coming wine. to us from your wine cellar, <laughs> Reggie? <laughs> Perfect timing. You see these guys? Yeah, Marcellus is hanging out in a pool, and, and Reggie's hanging out in a uh, wine cellar. All right, let's move to the smartest way to win, brought to you by Zip Recruiter. And there have been some teams expressing concern privately about all the attention surrounding Tua Tungviola, the Alabama quarterback, seen as one of the top two or three quarterback prospects in this draft. Some people have him as the best, but there are some teams concerned, is there too much attention around Tua? It almost sounds like people are saying he's got a little Tebow-esque quality, and that makes some teams concerned. And so, Mar Marcel, I'm going to ask you, are teams being leery of Tua's attention-seeking in the media? Is that the smartest way to win? Oh, man. Um, I, I don't think that Tua is doing too much. And I don't believe this article and its sincerity towards Tua. I don't think it's really portraying them in the right way, in the right light. One is a Miami article. I think they're just trying to keep everybody distant from Tua by saying, oh, here's the bad things. You know, we always see this in the draft process, something that is not flattering about a prospect, but in reality, behind the scenes, it's working to the tune of them getting that prospect and putting out bad information about him. But if you know Tua, man, look, there's two things to it. One, he's a free spirit. He comes from a different place. He's from Hawaii, man. Look, over there, they're not so socialized and caught up and jaded like us and maybe don't understand exactly the, the sociology that comes with playing NFL football and how to handle 
interviews. We saw him talking about he wanted to be the Cowboys backup. I don't think that was from a bad place. I think that was just a guy who was like, hey, I, can't, I, I grew up a Cowboys fan. So a little green if you want to go there. But also, this is a prospect who had the best career of all the top prospects, but was starting to get talked about in a negative light because of the injuries. So in order to restore order and get him back to where he belonged, he had to talk his way into that because he couldn't show it on the field necessarily. So he was motivated to talk a little as well. Yeah, Marcellus, um, I, I agree with you. Um, I think because of the crazy times that we're in right now because of this coronavirus, um, you know, there's a different way that some guys may have to showcase themselves. And I think for Tua, I think he's doing a great job because, like you said, we can't see him on the football field as much right now because of the state of, of where our country is at right now. But I think from people hearing him talk about his injury, hearing him say that he feels great, uh, seeing some snippets of videos here and there, I think that's all good stuff because, you know, Tua, in my opinion, a healthy Tua is just as good or better than a, uh, a healthy Joe Burrow. Yeah, I think what Tua is suffering from is he is the most interesting man in the NFL draft. His story is incredible. He plays at the uh, the program that's the most historic probably in college football, Alabama. He plays for Nick Saban. The Jalen Hurts to a, a quarterback drama in Alabama elevated his profile. And now he's coming off this injury and there's all this wonder and intrigue like, hey, he was the number one quarterback before this injury. Will he be able to be the same guy after the injury? And so I think what some people are reacting to is like, damn, there's more stories being written about Tua than Joe Burrow, who won the Heisman Trophy and allegedly is going to be the number one pick. Justin Herbert, the quarterback uh, out of Oregon. There's more conversation about Tua than him, the big who's got the big body and the whole thing. Jordan Love. Tua's the quarterback we're talking about the most, and some people are blaming Tua for that. I just think the narrative on Tua is so fascinating, it forces us to talk about him. And Tua isn't shy about conversing with the media, and he's probably a little too authentic and transparent, and I'm referring to his comments about wanting to be a Cowboys player. Marcellus? I agree with you, man. Uh, he's more storied. Uh, he's more famous. And he had a better body of work. So, of course, if you're thinking about looking to interview a prospect, especially the one who had his career cut short because of injuries, as great as Tua is, there could have been more to the Tua story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's intriguing for any network to bring him in. And, and I'm not taking any shots at Joe Burrow, but if you look at his entire career, you probably say... That was a one-year wonder, and you're hoping to get more of that. But that's not as intriguing a story as Tua, especially from someone who's not even from the mainland as well. So you have his backstory on top of what you saw on the football field, on top of the program he was in, on top of the prospects going forward. So it's a lot to Tua, and I don't think he's doing anything negative to fuel that fire. Reggie, you dealt with as much hype as anybody coming out of college football. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for, for Tua, I think Marcellus, you made some great points because there is that element of the unknown because we didn't get to see him finish out uh, his last couple games as a college quarterback. And so there's that element of, man, I wish we could have seen Tua play in the playoffs because we knew if he was healthy, Alabama would have been in the playoffs and see him compete head to head against Joe Burrow and those LSU Tigers. So people are still very excited about Tua, which they should be. Uh, because he has the quickest release also out of any of these quarterbacks that are coming out of the draft, and a quick release uh, quickly translates to the NFL. All right, let's move to Jadavian Clowney, who still hasn't signed a free agent contract this offseason. It's a little bit surprising. Uh, he, left, he wanted out of Houston. He goes to Seattle, performs relatively well, but the reports are that Jadavian wanted $20 million a year on average in his new contract. No one seems to want to meet that demand. Now there's a report that he has lowered his price tag to $17 or $18 million. Marcellus, the question here is, 
has he lowered it enough to lure somebody to go after it? Oh, I think he's dropped it enough. But the problem is, since he's already publicly dropped it, since I know about this, you know about this, we all know, he's going to have to continue to drop it. It's going to turn into a swap meet. It's going to turn into a bidding war of who can get <laughs> Jadavian on the cheap. That's sad, man. This is really bad play by the agent. And I don't know who his agent is, but this should not be on public record, the, the decline the loss of wages for whoever is going to get Jadavian Clowney services, whether it's Seattle, whether it's Tennessee, or they keep dropping to get another team interested. We heard the Jets are even poking and kicking the tires around right now. It's a really sad state of affairs. As we know, in any negotiation, the first thing you don't want to do is set the number. Like, you want to go to any negotiation, and you make the other person set the number. But now Jadavian has to set his own number, and he has to set it lower than he wants to. I think this is just really a bad display of how the <clears> process <throat> works if you're not being properly guided. Yeah, I think it's going to be tough for Jadavian Clowney. Um, at the $20 million range, um, I think maybe even possibly at the $17, $18 million range, I think it could still be tough for a team to want to offer him that because at the end of the day for defensive ends, the one of the most important stats is that sack stat. And last year, Clowney only had three sacks. Um, so that's not to say that he this year won't be much better. But if he does get $17, $18 million a year and he does not perform, then that team is going to be looking to move him because that would then be two years in a row where he hasn't been able to produce from the sack range. And so I think it's going to be tough for him. I hope he gets paid that much money because I love seeing players get what they think their value is. But I think it'll be tough for a team to still pay him even that $17, $18 million range. Yeah, Jadavian's in a tough spot. I can relate to uh, what Jadavian's going through. I, you know, I've spent most of my life 2 a.m. hoping somebody's got beer goggles on and has lowered their standards <laughs> to a level where they would even consider me. So Jadavian's right now... Price. In that spot, it's a, it's a tough spot. It's a very tough spot. He may have to drop down to about $10, 9000000 million. All right, yeah, thank you, Reggie. Yeah. Great job. Uh, Uncle Jimmy job. is coming in next. He's going to have his approval ready for Lamar Jackson. More speak for yourself after this. Hey, uh, who's your big dummy of the day? Hey, man, big dummy of the day. Go to the person that keep on putting that picture up of LeVar Arrington in the crib with that bear. LeVar ain't looking happy at all, man. The only one smiling is the bear. <laughs> hey, man, I worked at a jail for 17 years. I've seen that look before, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how they that got hair. LeVar with what blonde hair. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we're not going even going to go there. All right, listen. <laughs> we had a conversation about Fair Lamar shit. Jackson earlier. Uh, he's been hanging out with uh, Antonio Brown. None of us had a problem with it, Uncle Jimmy. I'm sure you don't. What's your thoughts on Lamar Jackson hanging out with Antonio Brown? Y'all ain't got no problem with that. Okay, of course y'all don't. No. I'm worried. I'm worried about Lamar. And I'm serious. At this time last year, at the end of the season, what was we saying about Lamar Jackson? We was talking about how he was just a student of the game how he was an MVP candidate, face of the league, right? All right, and then what happened? He loses the Super Bowl, and then all of a sudden he feel like he got to go change his whole image. He got to go remake himself. So now I guess he want to turn into Tupac, right? But let me tell you something. <laughs> he ain't no gangster. No what? more than Tupac is a gangster, all right? Now I'm going to tell you what. Antonio Brown is a gangster, Okay. Now, I guarantee you, the next time we see Lamar Jackson, he going to have thug life tattooed across his chest. No. Talking about, talking about no, that life not. you love to give. All right. <laughs> next time we see him, he going to look like he, he, he look like he just signed the deal on the for, for, for death, de death bro records with, with, with Suge Knight. <laughs> look at me. You laugh if you want to, man. I think right about now. I, I think I'd probably rather be a Selly with Suge Knight than be best friends with Antonio Brown, all right? <laughs> I'm going to take a <laughs> Hey, you no, laughing, man. Antonio that ain't right. Brown that ain't true. burnt up his laughing. own feet. 
If he burnt up his own face, right, what got... the hell Lamar Jackson think he'd do to him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> burnt his own feet, huh? All right, I got to go to my approval feet. rating. Still got Lamar in GOAT status, but this is the first time we've done it since he lost that playoff game. So I dropped his job performance from perfect to an 18. Uh, all-time greatness took a hit as well. Uh, got him at an 80, still GOAT status. Man, for a guy who had no problem with the picture, you sure know how to express it. Everything went down. What, what the hell happened? For me, it's no problem. First time we've done it. First time oh, we've done it since on, he uh, lost in the playoff. But right, he won the MVP since the, uh, then as well. The internet so agrees with me, up. have him at an all-star. I got right, That's I it for us. Go. We'll see you on Friday. Can't wait.